two, one, start broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to AMA Fridays, Ask Me Anything. Uh, the mini topic for today is accounting for disclosures, uh, reading the tea leaves, but really we're here to answer as many questions as we can, and I think uh, some of you may have questions from yesterday that we didn't uh, cover, so let let the questions begin. Martin? Nothing coming up on my screen about questions. Anybody who wants to speak, um, we can have you raise your hand and I'll unmute your side and you can ask a question or you can type a question and it's your choice. So we have nothing at this point, Carlos. Well, let me throw a question out there as we're covering this. How, how many uh, how many people out there have um, uh, implemented uh, or, or know even what um, uh, accounting for disclosures uh, has to do with? How many have a, like a, a, a program in place or a process already in place? Any hands? Um, one. Uh, De Debbie C., I'm going to open your mic if you want to talk to us, or you can type. Now, if you want to talk, just uh, you don't have to state your full name. Just you can. Uh, we prefer really just remain anonymous. But um, so. Okay, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna just yeah. continue. Um, Accounting for disclosures is something that you're going to be hearing a lot more about. It's already um, part of, it's always been part of the privacy rule. Um, and if you haven't heard about it, it's because uh, historically there's been very few patients that have asked for an accounting of their disclosures. And this really means a, um, you can think of it as, as someone asking for an accounting of every time within the last six years. Um, you shared the patient's PHI with anyone outside of the organization. Um, that would mean, you know, for um, bill paying, for, um, you know, for uh, other covered entities, uh, etc. right? And you have to go out and get this information from log files, and it has to have certain content in it when, when you provide essentially what you're providing is a kind of report to the patient. Okay. Uh, now that's always been in the privacy rule. It's 164.528. Uh, the High Tech Act modified it um, and changed it somewhat. And then HHS as part of what it was tasked to do under the High Tech Act had to come up with some uh, or came up with a proposed rule. Okay. Um, and that proposed rule got this hotly debated and uh, recently, I mean it's like two or three years past due, there was a tiger team of um, thought leaders put together and they come, they came out with a recommendation of sort of let's do, a, you know, recommend the OCR to the OCR do a prototype first and here's the thing is that the industry is really scared to death that um, there's no um, really good way to automate uh, this type of accounting because if you think of what is usually in um, audit logs, that's where you start to gather the information maybe of what was disclosed outside of the organization, but it doesn't have, you know, the purpose of the PHI, I mean the purpose of the disclosure, uh, the name of the individual, this other data, and so you're left with essentially a manual task. So um, this is sort of the first part of um, a webinar that we're going to be having on, uh, let's see, October, March 13th. Uh, we haven't scheduled, scheduled it yet. Look for the, the newsletter, um, March's newsletter for a, uh, the upcoming webinar. We're going to do a, an entire webinar on uh, accounting for disclosures, but and what we're going to cover is the current regulations, what high tech uh, or how high tech changed accounting for dis disclosures. It's really 
the law now, okay, because high tech has been in effect uh, for quite some time now, even despite the fact that HHS is lagging and hasn't um, caught up with the regulations. And, you know, likely HHS is not going to uh, uh, enforce it right now, but it's still the law of the land. And if you got, had a breach or had some other reason why HHS came to audit, uh, you know, or if you had 20 people ask you for an accounting right now, what would you do? And, you know, it, it says under the current law, uh, and as it was modified, you, you have to produce it. So, um, you know, what we're going to talk about is what it is, and then really how should you go about dealing with the sort of interim state that we're in before the final rule is um, promulgated. And unfortunately, you know, that, that whole thing about having interim rules, there, here in this case, there's not even an interim rule, but, you know, uh, uh, people waiting for a final rule, I, I think OCR does a really poor job of um, in, uh, not informing people that regardless that they haven't uh, issued the final rule, it's still the law because high tech is already in effect. So this is where we are. You know, this is where you can find the weekly URL. If you're looking uh, to attend, you go to this uh, store.hipsurvivalguide.com.news, you will see uh, where you can register for this Friday's. Obviously, you can register um, every time, every week. So that's where you go. Or if you go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide, you can click on the store uh, and get there. So the current state. Um, I do have one okay. question, though, so far. <clears throat> okay. And it's a very interesting question. When a provider suspects abuse, of a vulnerable adult, and can they make? Can they send the patient's records to DSS, or want, when they want to make a complaint to DSS? Um, I'm I'm not exactly sure who DSS or HHS. Department of, of uh, I, I assume it's Department of Something Services. HHS, you mean Health and Human? No, no. This I think this is a state uh, situation. Um, let me. I can re-ask the question. Let me, there, there are there are provisions um, within the rule to to protect um, uh, actually to protect someone that may disclose. Uh, that, um, I believe this is part of. Um, what HHS is working on in the final rule, and I'm not sure what the current state of that is, but I think they're building in some protections for the person that disclosed if, um, um, so that there can't be retribution, you know, and, and things like that. So, you know, I, I think that that's part of what's, what's still in flux, and the reason that it's in flux and, and really, uh, you know, we're like five years out from the High Tech Act, and no final rule yet. This is one case where the industry really, really pushed back hard, and um, HHS is rightfully um, slow walking it because there's really no no really effective means of implementing this. But I, I, I do recall a provision to protect the disclosure, um, uh, the party, the individual, the staff member who's disclosing. Uh, and you're, you're right. That's probably a it, it, it it's partly a state law issue because um, who you can disclose to, who's a legal representative, all that, there, there's um, regulations, there's HIPAA regulations that are on point, uh, but they mostly defer to state law. So that is going to be different for every state. Um, when we're talking account, accounting for disclosures, you know, the place that we need to start is what does a disclosure mean? Well, it means the release transfer provision of access to or divulging in any manner of information outside of, in any manner of information. I must have um, copied that wrong. Outside the entity holding the information, so it, it, it could be to a business associate. And actually, business associates we'll see right now have to. Um, I mean, the covered entity has to has to provide the disclosures of the business associate or give the patient a list of all the business associates and say. Okay, you go contact all these individuals, and this is how you can this is how you can get the information. That you know that's that's uh, 
partly crazy in, in and of itself, but that's how that's how it reads. And this is so it could be to anybody. It could be to a, a, the pharmacy, to a lab, to a, another covered entity. It, be, it could be coming out of your EHR system. It could be coming out of whatever systems you may have. You have to go out and gather all that log information and try to put together this accounting. Uh, and you know the, the the term is accounting of disclosure. I like to use accounting for disclosures, but um, it's a mess. It's it's really a monster, uh, and it's a time by it's a time bomb, compliance time bomb that's ticking because sooner or later um, HHS will be forced to finalize the rule and, and go forward with this thing because they were man mandated to do so under the High Tech Act and. Um, the High Tech Act is already law. So, if you wanted to see the current state, you would go. You'd go to 164.528 uh, on the HIPAA Survival Guide, and that that's the current rule. And it, it's the standard is that an individual has the right to receive an accounting of disclosures of PHI made by the covered entity in the six years prior to the date on which the accounting is requested, except for this laundry list of disclosures. So for treatment, payment, and operations, right now, that's an exception. You don't have to uh, provide those disclosures. And as you might imagine, there's a lot of disclosures that would fall into the TPO bucket. Now, what happened is, though, that, okay, that was okay, and that's probably one of the reasons why there hadn't been, well, there were lots of reasons why there hadn't been that many uh, accounting requests because I think the, the market uh, really wasn't that educated and there aren't that many people asking for access to their PHI. There are not that many people asking to amend their PHI So and there's less people asking for an accounting. So, uh, But the TPO exception eliminated probably a lot of the information that people may want to get. And what happened is, um, well the huh is how do you go about separating in your logs what information you're supposed to provide from what information um, you can provide? So that's 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 the mess right there. You have all these audit, potentially all these audit logs, and some of it is stuff you should provide. Some of it is stuff stuff disclosures you should provide a report of. Now, it's not the PHI. You're not giving the, the, the you're not giving the patient a, a the PHI that was sent. You're just giving them a report of a disclosure, and as we'll see later, that report has to have cer certain content, uh, the purpose for the disclosure, blah, 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 three or four requirements, and none of that stuff is in the audit law. So it has to be, it's by definition right now, a uh, manual process, and yes, it's accounting for disclosures is a, is a monster. This is a monster that the, the, the industry really doesn't have to... Uh, doesn't want to deal with, and you know, oddly enough, it's been in that requirement that we just reviewed. It's been in the privacy rule since the very beginning. High tech didn't introduce that. What high tech did was it modified it. So the daunting and immediate challenge to recognize is this: How do you separate what you must provide from the exceptions in your organization's audit logs? Okay, can you imagine uh, right now if you got hit, and I asked this question with a uh, hundred request? For disclosures, what would you do? Well, you know what we're going to see here. You have 60 days to respond. So this is one of the patient's bill of rights that has a bunch of due process requirements. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't get to think about think about it for 90 days and say we'll get back to you. You actually got to respond within 60 days. So I can imagine somebody running around trying to figure out a what audit logs do we have? B how are we going to how are we going to satisfy this request? Now even if the majority of your, even if you have an EHR, and the majority of your um, disclosures come through the EHR, uh, and and the and the EHR is doing a good job of logging, you still don't have all that other information that you're supposed to uh, provide regarding the disclosure. Like I said, you know the purpose, et cetera, et cetera. These three or four different. Uh, uh, pieces of content that you got to provide for every instance of disclosure. So, uh, and the reality is, is the EHRs are going to represent one of several, if not many, apps that a CE or BA may have that contains PHI, right? That you have to actually go 
look at audit logs to figure out what the disclosures are. And it's going to remain a mostly manual process, despite the fact that EHRs may produce the lion's share of disclosure content going forward. And that's, that's the problem that we just talked about is because no EHR right now that, that, that I'm aware of, and this was the Tiger team's pushback, is actually uh, producing uh, disclosure content in a way that you could press a button and automate it. It doesn't, they don't capture these other pieces of information um, automatically. So and this is why the monster has remained hit, hidden is because really the number of accounting requests have been negligible since the privacy rule was introduced and and you know we're talking about the privacy rule has been introduced been in in uh, place now for about 10 years it was like 2004 right so this is kind of a a, a well kept secret that patients are entitled to this but you know sooner or later it's not going to be a well kept secret because you have the whole e patient movement you have the, the you know the 80 million boomers retiring they're more literate you're just going to you know you're just going to see uh, more people trying to figure out what you've done with their phi and um, i suspect that most organizations out there right now don't have a even a manual way you know they, they uh, since most small and medium sized organizations have never done a risk assessment, they probably don't even know which applications are producing content um, that you would have to gather for a disclosure. Right? So that's one of the things you would do in a risk assessment is go inventory all your applications and all the places where you might be capturing this information. Now we're just going to walk through uh, pieces of this, but I'm going to stop right now because this is really intended to be uh, ask me anything. So, is there any questions out there, even uh, uh, regarding what I've just covered? Uh, nothing's come through at this time. And, and let me just say to everybody, you know, if if a thought occurs to you while we're going through any of this, just write it down, and and I will uh, just type it in, and I will capture it, and we will get to it. Yeah. Now we don't have. You don't have to have questions regarding uh, what I'm presenting. All right. It can be. It, this is really ask me anything. I'm just. We have material to present in case you know you don't you don't have questions now. Uh, historically, I think people are just a, a little shy about asking questions. But you could ask about yesterday's webinar. You could ask about something else that's pressing that you you would like uh, an answer to. Well, we do have. The, we do have a pressing one. So we do uh, have a question. Okay. Right. Can you give an example of a disclosure outside of EHR? Yes. I mean, anytime you fax, anytime you fax something to uh, uh, regarding a patient to another covered entity, um, that would be a disclosure, right? That's one that probably goes on hundreds of thousands of times a day across the country. You know, uh, so it, it's really, really uh, broad. If, if, um, for example, if you you, you have a um, uh, CPOE system that interfaces that's apart from apart from your EHR, right? You have an order entry system apart from your EHR that sends out uh, that automates the the sending out of uh, prescriptions to various pharmacies through an e-prescribing gateway that's a disclosure when you start thinking about it that's why that's why I was saying is that it, 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 it's it's this monster that's out there that nobody really knows about because once you start open up Pandora's box you see what kind of crazy um, requirement this is in, in in the form of how complex it could uh, it could be <coughs> Here's a, a here's another okay. one uh, along the same lines, but it's uh, more of a, an attorney question. Even though patients may not be aware of of this, and we're referring to the patients' bill of rights, are attorneys aware, and do they routinely have patients exercise this right in related litigation? Um. No, I, no, I don't think that they. I don't think that they do. Most, most, um, you know, I, I mean, attorneys specialize, right? So you have personal injury attorneys, you have 
copyright attorneys, you have, you know, yada, yada, HIPAA attorneys. You, so everybody, everybody nowadays, uh, you know, specializes. But the personal injury guys, they're the ones that are requesting uh, medical records all the time. They just do it via um, the legal process by I issuing a subpoena. And they just subpoena the medical records from the provider, and that's how they get access to it. Okay, so they don't really ask the patient to, they could, they could, uh, I, and I suspect that the answer would be mo no. Most attorneys aren't aware of that. That the patient could actually go ask for all these disclosures, uh, because usually what they're interested in is getting medical records, and they just subpoena. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, if a subpoena does come through to a practice, does that have to be listed as a disclosure? Well, that's actually a good question. So, if we backed up to the rule, right? Here's something that's changed going forward. Uh, so, except for right these areas. So everything uh, you have to provide everything except for currently and uh, treatment, payment, and operations. Except the uh, High Tech Act changed that for electronic health records, and it, it, it changed that exception. And that's the real monster. That's why this, the industry panicked, right? Because you have meaningful use, you have all this incentive to move to electronic health records, but 13405C of the High Tech Act took away the, the TPO exception. So that's, and you got to provide it for three years. So, you know, it, it, that, that's where the, the industry said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. So, you know, is there, um, you know, you don't have to provide a disclosure if you provide the, inf uh, the individual the information. Uh, incident to or use of disclosure otherwise permitted or required, I think, you know, uh, probably not, right? Incident to or use of disclosure, those legal requests are permitted, right? They're permitted uh, under the rule, so you probably wouldn't have to uh, do that. This is the laundry list of exceptions, and, you know, there, there, there are, um, in effect, Right, already under HIPAA, saying that you can provide it for you know for the purposes of litigation, etc. So I mean that's how you would go about answering the question is you go back to to the statute and you say, well, does it fall under one of these exceptions? But here's what here's what happens in the in the proposed rule. Um, the proposed rule doesn't give you exceptions. They, the proposed rule gives you a laundry list of um, a laundry list of disclosures that are permitted. So they really, you know, they flip sort of the question. These are the ones that are permitted. Everything else is excluded. And the um, proposed rule, you know, it makes this distinction between an access report and a disclosure report. And I think HHS was really struggling with trying to um, balance uh, you know this monster, and but having now looked at the proposed rule pretty hard, I, I think there is no balance in the monster. The monster remains, and um, it's not clear to me that uh, what HHS is is proposing to do in the new rule really mitigates any of the uh, complexity uh, involved here. And that's that's actually um, a raging uh, sort of discussion right now around OCR has made some statements of late saying, you know, we know small practices aren't doing risk assessments because they're too complex, and now we're going to provide this simple tool. And the problem is just to cut through sort of the Washington mumbo-jumbo BS that, that comes out of government agencies is um, these are the unintended consequences. A risk assessment is, by definition, not an easy thing to do. And, you know, it's my opinion that small practices, medium-sized practices are pushing back because they don't want to do it. They don't want to, uh, uh, you know, there is no tool simple enough to dumb down something that's gotten to be really, really complex. And it's not complex, um, you know, because the regulations make it complex. Obviously, it's the law, so you got to do it. So, But it, it's complex because the threat landscape has become inordinately complex, and the bad guys have better and better tools to attack your network, and they're getting in through all kinds of different vectors, and so 
uh, the response to that is not going to be a simple response. The response to that is going to be, you know, uh, not simple tools, but really powerful tools that are competitively priced, or some software as a service uh, offering that comes in and helps you scan your network and partly automates um, the risk assessment process and some other tools. And, um, you know, and just a shameless plug from a process and methodology perspective, tools that we provide, it's going to be a combination of those things, but HHS doesn't really want to go there because that sort of drives up the expense. You're not going to get that free. Now, those tools are getting better and they're getting more competitively priced, but they're not free, and they uh, exceed the cost of uh, what um, HHS says the implementation should be because those I don't know if anybody's ever looked at those costs, but the, those costs are laughable, <laughs> and everyone sort of knows it. It's so you know HHS is trying to make nice with the industry and come out with a simple tool, but no simple tool is going to solve this problem in our lifetime. And so you have uh, you know uh, you, you have OCR, in my humble opinion, uh, create helping helping contribute to the problem instead of helping solve it by denying or by even uh, stating that you could come up with a simple enough tool. It's not, it's not going to happen in our lifetime, and what they're really creating is more roadkill because those small practices and medium-sized practices that, you know, that take that uh, cue from OCR saying, oh, we're just going to wait for OCR. We're not going to do one. We're not going to wait for OCR to provide us the simple tool. You know, the reality is the practices don't want to do it, and the OCR should just confront that. But um, some fair amount of those are going to have a, a major breach. And we, you know, and we talked about that's why breach is the is the 800-pound gorilla. And those, when that major breach happens, when that lost laptop walks out the door with 30,000 records, some small practice is going to wind up with a million and a half dollar fine. And OCR can't escape that. That's the gorilla. That's the stick. No matter what they do. They're not helping small to medium-sized practices by helping them stick their head in the sand because you get that gorilla that keeps knocking on the door, right? And that's only going to hold up as to the next. Uh, and I'm not saying, look, small to medium-sized practices have a challenge. Everybody's known this all along. The first time I looked at the security rule, it was like, oh my God, man! I mean, this looks like it's a specification for CIA security, which is probably where where they got it. But it is what it is. It's the law. And now, you know, it, it, this is where the law is now, run, you know, having a head-on collision with reality. And OCR is, is sort of out to lunch on this whole story here by, you know, uh, saying they're going to provide a simple tool. I mean, NIST has provided tools. And, you know, that was supposedly were going to be a simple tool. And just to raise the hands, anybody ever use one of those NIST uh, simple tools for, um, I believe it was for risk assessments. Is anybody even aware that it was out there? I have one hand. That's all I have is one hand. Right. So here's, here's the thing with that simple tool that NIST provided, is NIST just provided a, a, a tool that plays, you know, I, look, the NIST documentations are great as a reference, but they don't tell you what to do. They, they play 20 questions for every requirement for 164.528. If they were helping you, they're mostly they're mostly focused on a security rule. This is a privacy rule provision. But if they were, uh, you know, if, if they were telling you how you should go about dealing with 164.528, they they go into this laundry list of questions you should ask. Well, you know, that's nice. But you know, these laundry these 20 questions make you want to pull your hair out because, you know, that's the problem. That's not simplifying it for you. So they took those 20 questions for a given standard. Right, and they put it into a tool, and they call that simplifications. It's not, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, we have to come to terms that the world really has changed, and I, I mean, the world has changed in the in the 24, 365, always online cyber universe that we live in now. Right, it requires a not a simplistic response. The response is not going to be simplistic, and so, um, you know, that's the challenge. And here. This is just another example of account, accounting for disclosures. Is you know, it, 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 if it was widely requested right now, you know, you would you would be probably seeing a lot more pushback. The reason there is a little pushback is just people just don't know. So. 
Okay, we've got uh, some questions here that we can deal with. Uh, this is regarding ACOs that are requesting are requesting by requiring a practice to send them their claim data. Some of the patients in the claim submitted are not associated with the ACO. How can the ACO require this? Well, you know, I don't, the Affordable Care Act is, um, or an, account, an accountable care organization, you know, and uh, that's a whole different um, animal, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not really sure uh, if the visions for that came out of uh, the Affordable Care Act, and they, pro they probably do come out of that, uh, and that's a non-HIPAA um, piece of legislation, it's a whole different other beasts, so I really don't have an answer to uh, how ACOs could be requiring um, claim data be provided to them that um, you know doesn't uh, doesn't belong to them. You know, that's 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 probably a great uh, you ping your local council, and you know you're gonna have to pay them if they don't know for some research into the ACO because I you know they, it, on its face it looks like um, that would be a disclosure that would be not permitted under the um, under the privacy rule unless the ACO is a treatment partner, another covered entity and a treatment partner. And then, of course, you can disclose uh, information for treatment. Okay, um, I mean, you can do that. That doesn't violate the privacy. That doesn't violate the privacy rule of providing other information to other covered entities. Uh, you can do that. And if the ACO is another covered entity, that would be the uh, that would be the uh, potentially the cover, but you know, if you're if you're doing it in mass for claims data, then that's probably an entirely different um, use case. Okay, um, uh, please explain the example of the fax as a disclosure again. Yes, if you. If you if you are faxing the um, the accounting for disclosures is not like it's it, this is what what's troublesome about it is it, it's it's all disclosures it's not limited to um, well now if it's in if it's in um, if it's an EHR um, it would be it would be um, Let's say, for example, uh, in order for this hypothetical to work, it, it, it would be if you have an EHR, and if the EHR, which probably a, a, a lot of the sophisticated ones do, have some sort of faxing capability uh, built into them, okay, and you you e-fax the patient's record from within the electronic health record because you could because that's that functionality was there, then under the High Tech Act. That would not be accepted. It would not be an accepted um, disclosure. In other words, you would have to disclose the fact that you shared that piece of information for treatment, payment, or operations. Okay, or you know, uh, so that would be something that you would have to that that you would have to share. Now, outside um, Yeah, completely, completely outside of a um, uh, outside of an EHR is probably something that we have to wait on till we uh, have the webinar. We can get completely through this, and you can talk about the pro the the proposed rule because um, HHS has given some th taken away some things and has given some things and is trying to um, limit what can be disclosed. To what's in a de uh, what's in a what's in a what's called a designated record set, okay? There's nothing about a designated record set today in 164.528, okay? But what's in the desert? The definition of a, a, a DSR is really quite broad, and so HHS, under its own authority, is saying if it's in a designated record set, then uh, you have to provide, it. and if it's electronic. Okay, so they 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 kind of expand just the EHR, uh, but they try to limit it by saying, well, it's only if it's in the DSR. Okay, and you know, then you would have all kinds of cases.
potentially that would be outside of an EHR still but still considered part of a designated record set where if you made that disclosure um, it wouldn't fall under the TPO exception okay so in order to put this into con context as to what's coming we really have to review what the as is state is now how how um, the High Tech Act modified it, right, and then how the proposed rule is attempting to modify it, attempted to modify it, and, you know, see where um, HHS is really going to go with this, right, Just so that you have a heads up. So today, yes, you can include, T you can exclude TPO, but um, any other kind of uh, disclosure that didn't fall into one of those exceptions you would make, and I think uh, what the high tech or what high tech did because it it it, it um, eliminated the TPO exception for EHRs opened this really Pandora's box that really got really crazy. And then I think HHS was trying to put put a lid on it, but I don't believe that that lid is really effective. Um, but we're going to have to defer that uh, until we can get through that part of it. But I will take some other questions right now on where we're at, take a few more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Regarding business associate agreements, I understand the exception for health care providers for treatment purposes. Does this include ambulance services, portable x-ray services, DMEs, nursing homes, in regards to agreements with hospice and home health agencies? You know, the... The answer to that question is, and it's not, it's not really, um, you know, if if they're if they're covered entities, and they're going to know, right? If you're um, like a nursing home, I think provides healthcare services. They have to be a covered entity. Um, I think you know, in ER, uh, let, let, let's say an ambulance, they're providing healthcare services when they pick you up and they take your vitals and they do whatever they're are doing that help save your life you can if it's another covered entity then you don't need a, a business associate agreement right a, a, a business associate agreement in general is going to be with some business partner uh, that is outside of the treatment space so you know somebody that's providing legal services to you somebody that's providing billing services or I mean there's all kinds of your EHR vendor on the cloud right there's all kinds of scenarios now that are uh, that where BA applies, but you really, if if in doubt, you just have to say ask the organization. I mean, you can go out to HHS and it's got some guidance, you know. But you can just ask the organization; they're going to know whether they're a covered entity or not. Uh, and you know, that, like the example we had from yesterday's webinar with with uh, LabQuest, labs are, are are considered covered entities, so you don't need, you don't need a BA for a lab. Okay, here's a particular scenario. Uh, an employee, speak of the devil, sends out a lab test uh, to PT's email, to the patient's email, but PT patient gave the wrong email. The email was not encrypted. Um, what should I do? Um, you know, yeah, we can play with those. Guys. It had it had a name, account, and date of birth on it only. I'm sorry, it came. This question's in three. Um, right, right. No, yeah. I, I mean that that's the pa that's the pattern, right? You have an inadvertent, inadvertent disclosure somehow, and uh, yes, you know the, the 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 patient may have given you uh, the wrong information, um, but there's no patient wrong information exception that I'm aware of. And if that email uh, didn't bounce, right? If, if if it actually was, I mean, you know, most of the time somebody messes up their email, it's it's going to bounce because the email address that that they actually gave you doesn't exist, and you're going to get it back, right? So if it never went through, I I would say you could safely assume that there wasn't a a breach. But if they happen to give you a messed up email that worked and it didn't bounce for some reason, then you have the same scenario, despite the fact that, yes, the patient may, you know, you could have documentation that the patient gave you this email address, but you have the, uh, you know, uh, people, organizations make mistakes all the time, right, and they send the wrong envelope to the wrong patient. And, you know, I had a, I had a question uh, earlier was, uh, take that example, right, you sent, 
you sent the wrong uh, envelope to the wrong person. It had obviously had the person's name, address, all that kind of stuff, and it was from ABC Cancer Center. Is that a breach? Well, yeah. If you look at the analytical framework, you know, is, is, is it unauthorized use or disclosure? Uh, un, un, unauthorized use or disclosure? Yeah. That that disclosure is not authorized. You sent it to the wrong uh, individual. Was it secured? Well, no. The f information on the face of the envelope is not secured. Does it fall within any one of the exceptions? No, not that I'm aware of. It's a breach, right? Because you got to assume if it went outside of the organization, the person read, even if they sent it back to you. It's not a question of whether they retained it. It's a question of whether somebody actually uh, saw the PHI. If the PHI, you know, the, the, the term of art is, was the PHI compromised, right? And that comp what means compromised is somebody else see it. And so uh, you would have to assume that that scenario, you know, I, I know it's troubling because that scenario probably happens all the time. And my response is, you know what, you probably are not going to get fined. You, you, you log it as a breach, report it to HHS at the end of the year, and that, prob that kind of inadvertent um, breach is probably not going to get you fined. Now, if you have hundreds of them, um, the inadvertent breaches, and you, then you had a major breach, 30,000 records, and now HHS is at your doorstep doing an audit, and not only do they find out that obviously you know they know you reported these thirty thousand, they find out that you have a thousand of these you know uh, sort of breaches that you were saying you know you 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 categorized this in, inadvertent and you didn't think it was a breach. Well, now it's a problem for you, right? Had you reported them, it probably wouldn't have been a problem because they happen all the time. They're inadvertent. You're probably not going to get fined for it, etc. But the fact that you hid them and called them by calling them inadvertent. And didn't do the proper analysis and didn't report it to HHS. Now you got a problem because now you got this thirty thousand breach and you got these other breaches and now probably HHS is looking, you know, on a witch hunt to see what they can find. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like Watergate. On those scenarios, it's it's a cover up that's going to get you. You know, I don't I don't believe HHS can whack anybody really hard for that kind of inadvertent breach because it's contrary to common sense. Uh, you know, those mistakes happen. I don't, uh, you know, I don't think you're gonna, you're going to get fine. So my recommendation would be, you know, uh, talk to your counsel. My recommendation would be, you know what, you're a lot safer probably reporting those at the end of the year than not. So, uh, Can we fax PHI on regular fax, not within EHR? Not with, I think it's, it's what it means, not with EHR. Well, I mean, you know, can you, I mean, everybody, everybody's been doing that for, um, in this, this will be the last question. So everybody's been doing that forever. You know, the, the question is, you know, is that reasonable and appropriate? And if, if you did it in an unsecured way, um, you know, could that be a breach? Now, it's not a it's not a breach just because you do it. The, the act of doing it, because the security rule doesn't mandate encryption. Okay. Now, that's just one of the weird things about the security rule. Probably if it had been written today, it, it might mandated but it's hard it's hard to mandate it because it's not in all instances it, it, is it is it possible right but is it reasonable and appropriate well in this day and age there are secure ways to fax nowadays there are secure encrypted ways to email right and so where you're going to where, where you're going to get bit is if it actually if if if, if somebody really was sophisticated enough to put a um, you know, a sniffer on your network and was capturing uh, every time you fax because you um, didn't have the information encrypted, right, and somehow got hundreds, if not thousands of records that way, then, you know, you're probably, it probably wasn't reasonable and appropriate to be sending faxes or email over clear text without having them uh, encrypted. So We have two questions left, Carlos. All right, we'll take these two and then that's it. Um, to clarify on breaches, so one of the identifiers, along with something like the Biz Cancer Center, on the envelope is enough to be a breach. Yeah, I would say that it is, right? Because you maybe maybe um, um, you know maybe it's your neighbor. They they got the address off by one. So now you know that John Smith is going to ABC Cancer Center, and that's enough, right? You have the, you have the, the the person has been identified. 
and some something related to their health care has been revealed, that's enough. Well, you have a secondary issue there, too. What if the postman puts it in your neighbor's mailbox by mistake and they open it? So, inadvertent. Well, you, you know, you could have uh, you, you could have an inadvertent breach, and then that's that's the scenario that we just talked about. I would report yeah. it, right? It's like it. it, it we, we don't want to uh, turn this into the, like the breach police. It is a breach. You know, I know everybody is fearing liability, but in this particular case, I think you're just better off not trying to cover up those incidental breaches that are going to happen, right? At the end, of, and, and if it's less than uh, 500. Uh, I believe it's 500 or 501, but uh, if it's 500 or less, then you don't have to report it right away. Within the next 60 days of the breach, you report it to HHS at the end of the year. Now, you could have, you know, 100 of these breaches or 500 of these breaches, actually, but if they, wasn't, they weren't part of one breach, you wouldn't have to report it right now. You don't wind up on the HHS wall of shame, and I, I would say you're better off reporting these things and trying to hide it because... Uh, in the current state is you're probably not protecting your your uh, your PHI the way you should. You're probably like you know 95% of the organizations out there right now that it's just it's a disaster waiting to happen when that laptop gets lost with you know 20,000 records when that phone gets lost you know because you can have 300,000 records now on a thumb drive, right? So it's the breach or a cus or a patient complaint that's going to get you, not some fear of some HHS audit, although HHS is going to start auditing in 2014, breaches the 800-pound gorilla that's going to bring somebody knocking on your door, and I would say just report those inadvertent breaches. You know, uh, you know, we made a mistake. We reported it. Our last question of the day. I work for a consulting company. When one of our medical practice clients calls us for help in troubleshooting an issue, we may see PHI while working with the client remotely. Would this fund fall under the TPO or be considered a disclosure? Well, first of all, that scenario that you just described, you're a business associate of the covered entity, okay, by definition. Whether or not you have a business associate agreement doesn't doesn't matter. That 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 relationship comes into effect by operation of law. Okay, so if you got that kind of partnership, you are um, you should have a you, you should have a business associate agreement, right? If, if you don't, um, that's a violation. But yes, if you if you we take a look at the definition of disclosure, was any any uh, uh, any instance where PHI was shared outside of the organization, and in fact. Uh, business associates disclosures by business associates are in effect today. If you're if a business associate under the existing 164.528, if a business associate were to if if for example you uh, you know ABC Consulting Company um, took a copy of the database and then um, for example then you had an independent contractor uh, that you hired to troubleshoot um, something that you couldn't fix. That's you know that would be a disclosure by you uh, as a business associate, and the patient has a right to that as well, all the way the, all the way down the line. So, uh, the the question followed up with they do have a business associate agreement. Yes, then it would be a it, it, it would be um, it would be a disclosure unless it's for treatment, payment, and operations. You know, um, uh, it's not clear to me that. Um, that that kind of troubleshooting would be um, under operations, but maybe somebody could make an argument. Now you gotta, you have to understand where we're at in HIPAA. HIPAA prior to the High Tech Act was on was, was an unenforced paper tiger. Okay, it was on the books. Everybody had their notice of privacy practices, but nobody ever got fined. It wasn't enforced, right? The High Tech Act was meant to change that, and it has changed that in a, in, a, in a very big way, and primarily because that breach notification 800-pound gorilla uh, is out there. But there hasn't been a lot of common law developed around these scenarios to get these answers. So these answers right now, we're left with whatever HHS guidance has provided and, um, and, not, and not much else, right? Because the federal courts haven't weighed in on making these sort of gray area uh, distinctions. Um, I, I would, you know, 
uh, err on the side of caution uh, with respect to that, uh, because I think nobody's gonna nobody's gonna uh, clobber you over the head for sort of this inadvertent stuff if you if you're making a good faith argue, uh, a good faith effort to comply. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of um, healthcare practices that aren't making a good faith effort to comply that haven't done a risk assessment that just basically you know. Um, said, you know what, I'd rather retire or get fined, or they, you know, an old grumpy doc says, well, let them put me in jail, I don't care, I'll pay the fine, or, you know, so, I mean, everybody knows that there's a huge amount of resistance out there, uh, and there always has been, but and, and, and that remains, that's a cultural thing, but, you know, the, the, the thing is that the world has changed, that gorilla is beating on your door, and you, you are going to have a breach, and, and so how do you deal with that? So I would focus on getting the basics covered. I know everybody worries about these hypotheticals and these gray areas and want to, you know. But it, I, I would say you're going to get you're going to get clobbered because you, you don't have you didn't do a good enough job to comply with the basics. If you're doing a pretty solid job with that, you know, you may get slapped on the wrist, but you're not going to you're not going to get a major fine. And that's why, you know, that's what you're trying to avoid. That's why, if you're, you know, with respect to PHI, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. You know, with respect to PHI, don't store any PHI locally on a mobile device. If you do some common sense like this and enforce it through uh, policy and sanctions, you probably cover 90% of the bad things that can happen. And then you can work on, 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 on the other ones. Okay? But that's not, that's not uh, the stance that you know, uh, the industry is taking just because they're, you know, the industry... Uh, just like every other industry, loves this whiz bang technology and having stuff on their phone and having stuff on their laptops, and that's just what we, you know, become accustomed to, uh, and therefore, you know, we just contribute to more and more breaches. So, all right, well, thank you, thank you for the questions, Brody. The questions are what AMA Fridays are all about. Obviously, we went longer than a, a half hour, but uh, thanks to your participation, that really um, um, makes this show meaningful. Thank you.